Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Uh, the dreaded B word is, I think, bound to pop up in the course of the next hour's conversation. But uh, have no fear, at the end of that, we should embark upon upon Mystery Hour. Get the kids involved as well in that. Um, quite a lot of people claim to be using Mystery Hour as a, as a homeschooling tool. I think you might be slightly over-egging the pudding there. Not least because <laughs> we don't actually fact-check it. We just sort of take it... Um, uh, I don't know. We let people go definitive if they sound plausible and, and convincing. So uh, you're not necessarily going to pass your exams by sounding plausible and c convincing. Unless you're doing PPE, I suppose. But I digress. Um... The B word's probably going to pop up because we're talking about farmers, British farmers, and the fact that they have been forced to fly in fruit and vegetable pickers from Romania uh, using specialist charter jets to keep up with demand. Now, how much of this is due to a huge collapse in the workforce already and how much of it is due to the coronavirus lockdown is it's an important question that I can't answer. Uh, I do know, and you know, um, you probably even know their names, that for reasons many of us will never fully understand, we spent years in this country letting nasty little scrotes march all over the television and radio studios, snivelling about how they wouldn't want to live next door to Romanians and, and using that as a reason for why we should leave the European Union. Um, and yet, everybody who seemed to know what they were talking about warned us that no one else will do this work, largely because it's seasonal. So it, it, it's the idea that you take X number of weeks out of your year, you come to the UK, you pick asparagus or, or, peat or, or, or apples, and then you go back with some money in your pocket because the jobs usually come with board and lodging. There's usually a sort of um, a campsite almost. I've visited a couple, one in Herefordshire, where the static caravans in which in, uh, everybody stayed while they were um, doing the work were, 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 were quite pleasant. I mean, they weren't... Uh, I presume they would pass health and safety legislation because they seemed nice to me, to my amateurish eye. But one imagines that some of the conditions are a little bit more... Um, a little bit less comfortable. So that's, that's going to be part of it. And, of course... Airlines aren't running. They've suspended services between the UK and most European countries. So I don't know that we should be too alarmed by that element of the story, chartering specialist jets. Um, they have to do that to get the people to come here who would have come here anyway, regardless of Brexit and regardless of coronavirus. But they can't come here because of uh, the suspension of, of air travel. Some of the numbers are fascinating on this. I don't know if you've had a proper look at them, but the number of people who expressed an interest in signing up was I, I was actually quite high and then the number of people who um actually accepted an offer of work was quite spectacularly low in fact the numbers are so stark and so striking that i'm not going to speculate on what they are i'm going to actually make sure that i get them right i'm, I'm going to dig them out for you the, the so the number of people that expressed an interest i think filled in an online form and then those applications get funneled and then you end up with a number uh of of people who've actually taken up work or accepted an offer of work in this field or uh, in these fields um it was staggering and the reason why i'm burbling and waffling slightly is that i'm trying to find it on my screen in front of me but i'm, I'm currently failing I'll, I'll dig it out for you shortly um so there's two ways into this the, the, the first is that it was obvious from, from the get-go that one of the great benefits of freedom of movement of people was the ability of farmers to bring in a temporary that's the word for me, a large temporary workforce. And by dint of the differences between our economies and our countries, that type of work, that temporary work, relatively low paid temporary work as well, um, is a lot more attractive to people in Romania than it is to people in Rutland. The other element of this, and, and I want first hand, although I appreciate that that's going to be tricky, if it's a job that you've done, um, give me a call and tell me what it's like. The question is, why can't unemployed British workers, especially workers who have been made unemployed during the lockdown, apply for farming jobs, okay? 
I don't want them to, for the record. Uh, I, I, I don't think you pay your national insurance or, or your income tax in expectation of being ordered to go and um, cut asparagus at half past four in the morning in a field in Evesham uh, uh, when, you, when you need help from the government. I don't like that element of it. That's just my personal position. The question still stands. The question I would like you to answer is, why can't British farmers get pretty much any British fruit and vegetable pickers? And, of course, if you fell for the lies and fell for the racism around this issue, you know I don't bear you any malice at all. Compassion for the con, contempt for the con men. Um, and this is one of those areas where there's no doubt at all about who the con men were. So that question for you is, is doubly important because you fell for the idea that there would be a workforce in place once we abolished freedom of movement of people and it would be homegrown, it would be British. And understandably, you ignored the warnings uh, from those of us who were trying to explain why you were wrong. But now we've actually got a huge number of British people sitting on their hands receiving support from the government, which is actually benefits, although they won't use those words. That's why we've had to introduce words like furloughed into the vocabulary. Um, and they still can't get the staff that they want. So why not? Why can British farmers not get British fruit and veg pickers? I'll give you my answers to that, and then and then you can give me yours. I, I don't like the Pretty Patel, Dominic Raab line of argument in, in that book that they co-wrote saying that British workers are a, among the idolist in the world. You know I find that sort of rhetoric repellent. But if that's your view, I, I guess today I have to hear it. There's, there's, there's three things that occur to me. The first is that word temporary. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a job in the sense of not knowing when it will end. You, you, you arrive in uh, April, you leave in August, and it's, it's a fixed period of work, and you have a rough idea, you have a fairly clear idea of how much money you'll be taking home at the end of it. So, number one, it's temporary. Number two, it's live-in. That, that, I think, makes a huge difference. So even if you, you, you quite fancied the idea of picking hops in Kent for the summer, like your grandma used to do, um, it would be very difficult to justify financially if you were travelling from home every day to start work in the fields. I think those slightly sepia-tinted, nostalgic memories of, of hot picking, I think they were holidays, weren't they? I think you did bed down in, 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 in tents and dormitories, and it was fun, and it was, um, it, it, I think, I mean, we're talking about a very, very different age, but that notion of it being live-in seems crucial to me. Most... British people, whether they're employed or unemployed, probably don't fancy the idea of, of upping sticks and moving into a shared static caravan for three months. Again, presumably the, the Pretty Patel Dominic Raab School of Patriotism would sort of tell them that they have to and, and order them to because they're so idle. And then the third one is very much linked to the others, but certainly the places I visited, uh, most recently in Herefordshire, where, I mean, it was, it was a big camp of, of t temporary workers. It would have been impossible to get there. And this seems like such an obvious thing, but actually, I don't know if it is obvious to you, that the reason why British farmers can't get British people to pick fruit and veg is because British people can't get there for a dawn start unless they've got a car, and if they've got a car, then, you know, the costs <laughs> are going to be huge. So, w w do you know that people laughed at me when I said to you that bus routes were really important? It, it was one of the things that he who must not be named uh, actually got right. Uh, the, the importance of bus routes to, to the British workforce, and just the British people, is massively underestimated. How do I know? Well, just tiny little experience from decades ago when I needed to get to a town in Shropshire from a town in Worcestershire and I was staggered to discover that there was one bus a week on a Tuesday afternoon. And it's much, much worse now. So if you've got a farm in the middle of the sticks, whether it's in Kent or Worcestershire or Herefordshire or wherever it may be, um, your workforce is not mobile enough 
to come and work for you every day. In fact, the only way you can get those fields cleared is by having the workforce sleeping on site. And so when the question becomes, why won't you do it? The answer is not so much that the money's not good enough, but that the remuneration includes accommodation. And I, I can't take this job unless I live there. And I don't want to live there. I don't want to live there. Um, don't forget, if you're thinking of ringing in, that we have to operate on the presumption that all of these employers, and for the record, I have no reason to suspect for a moment that they're not, but all of these employers are following, are, are obeying the law when it comes to minimum wage legislation and, and living wage legislation. So, it, 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 I, I suppose I might have to take an anecdotal claim that they're all working for one pound fifty, but. If you work on the principle that all of the employers are obeying the law, then the question of why can't they get British people to pick their fruit and veg, I think becomes really interesting. And I will give you 50 pence every time I fall into the trap of saying I told you so during the course of the next 45 minutes, all right? 50 pence each, maybe, possibly an IOU. 0345 is the number that you need. Um, inevitably, in my view, British farmers are flying in fruit and vegetable pickers from Romania on specialist charter jets, inevitably because there was no way British people were ever going to do this work, and I'm not comfortable ordering them to do so. Um, this is partly as a result of the coronavirus lockdown, that the chartering of specialist jets is precisely because of the coronavirus lockdown, it's because the airlines have stopped flying. But it, it makes an absolute mockery of those arguments made by close to 17.4 million people that, oh, don't worry about them, we'll be able to replace them with dot, dot, dot. How's that working out for you? Presumably, all, all that money that was raised last year by the Brexit Party Limited that's... Um, I don't know where it is at the moment, but, but I guess the patriotic thing to do would be to direct some of that towards struggling farmers. And actually, speaking of the Brexit Party Limited, there's an awful lot of unemployed ex-MEPs. Presumably they're all queuing up to cut asparagus and pick apples. British farmers flying in hundreds of Romanian farm workers to pick fruits and vegetables. Um, even with uh, an, an uptick in this, I think that this, the plane arriving today is the first of up to six to operate in the coming months to keep farm staff with labour. As many farmers are warning that, that a lot of their crops will go unpicked, will, will rot in the fields, up to a quarter I heard on one report this morning. Some of us said this would happen, even without the COVID-19 crisis, that the abolition of freedom of movement would um, create appalling problems. Government can fix some of those problems by um, giving exemptions. I end up giving exemptions to almost everybody. And, of course, COVID-19 has also seen an evolution of that notion of unskilled labour. Um, many people who, a couple of months ago, were being told by Priti Patel that they were unskilled labour and largely unwelcome have suddenly been upgraded to key workers. All they need now is a pay rise. But all of this, I think, plays into the question of, of why do British farmers have to fly in foreign pickers? Dave's in Brighton. Dave, what would you like to say? Thanks, James. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I've got time on my hands. I was, I was thinking, I'd like to work in great outdoors. I'd like to do something useful. And so yeah. I set up the, uh, the local summer fruit farms. And uh, I live in Brighton, and there's one in Chichester. So I got in contact yeah. with them. And so I'm doing my sums. It's, it's about 54 quid a week for a caravan, Jones. Um, that, and you pay that to the farmer? Yeah, you pay that to the farmer. Yeah. <clears throat> Meanwhile, you know, I've, I've got my two, three hundred pound a week mortgage or rent. I mean, I'm sure that's about yes. average. Um, it's going to take me on my Google just now. It says 49 minutes to drive there. Now, it's minimum that's petrol way. as well. Uh, it, correct. So my petrol. It, would it be cheaper to drive there every day than it would be to rent the caravan? Forgive my ignorance. Well, the problem is, uh, I'm still paying all my bills at home, a mortgage month. Oh, of course you are. Yes, of course you are. Uh, and, and, and that is going to be about 200 quid a week. So doing the sums, working on the national minimum wage, which this would be, it really doesn't add up. If 
um, and I did contact one or two, if they were to say, well, look, we know that we're going to get better prices, there's going to be a shortage, we're going to gamble on uh, getting people in who aren't feckless, who would like to work, but can't make the sums add up at national minimum wage, pay them an extra £5 an hour, see if we can work out a deal with the government, I would do it. Do it, James, because the sums would add up. Um, Do you know what the work's like? I, I... only from what I read. I don't know anybody who's worked in the sector. I should imagine it's, it's very draining. It's going to be tough. I'm in my 50s. I probably would feel it in the first couple of days. But, uh, no, I'd see it as a challenge. Um, but I'm and, sure. and, and also, you know, you, you mentioned your age, but I mean, even if you weren't operating at anything like the rate of a, of a younger, more experienced picker, at least you'd be picking stuff, which would otherwise, it seems, not, not have been picked at all. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have thought so. And I, I'd have thought I'd probably get up to about their speed. I'd probably get faster than them. I, I see that as a bit of a competition, actually. No, seriously. I like that. I, I, but so what would you need? It's £8.72 at the moment. You're suggesting that you'd do it for 14 quid a week? 14 quid an hour. Sorry, not a week. Oh, sorry, and, yeah, I mean an hour. It's £8.72 an hour. You're saying you'd do it for 14 quid a week, which would automatically put you on more money than many nurses. Right. Okay. So I'm I'm still spending my uh, seven or eight hours travelling there to and from. Um, yeah. I'm still paying the petrol, um, but it's going to keep me out of mischief. I'll be doing something useful, and I'll be getting fit. <laughs> so and you get all the strawberries you can eat. You get all the strawberries you can eat thrown in as well. I like your explanation. It's 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 completely free of xenophobia. Or racism. Uh, I, I mean, it's a little bit pie in the sky to suggest that the farmers, I think you know this, could afford to pay you 14 quid an hour, isn't it? But as you say, if they're going to get a big bonus as a result of shortages, then maybe they could suck it up. You know what my next question is going to be, Dave. What happens next year? I'm not an economist. Uh, all I can <laughs> is I'm sure that there are farms right now where farmers are saying, they're complaining, wringing their hands, saying, we're going to let our millions of pounds worth of crops rot in the fields because... But we can't pay you about, more than £8.72 an hour, minus a quarter do something so about it. It's, in, it's, it's, under your, it's in your control. And look, even if it doesn't work, a farmer tries it, but, you know, they... They lose, I don't know, a couple of grand. They trial it. They put oh, they're going to lose a, potentially a lot more than that. They could, they, could, they could themselves go bankrupt. I mean, that, that, that was one of the first warnings. It was about Welsh hill farmers, actually, if we do end up with no deal at all. But, the, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I'm not comfortable coating the farmers, although yeah. uh, a lot of them are very, very wealthy. They are very big operations. I, I, I'll meet you halfway on this. They... they, 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 they well, they're probably going to have to increase the wages to, to fill some of the shortfall, but they're not going to be able to increase them by £5 an hour from a starting point of £8.72 because the business model just wouldn't sustain it. Well, I found I the numbers that, as well. Go on. I think what's going to happen... Sorry, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, what I think is going to happen is that there will be a point at which prices start to increase. I mean, just pure supply and demand. And when that happens, yes. then they'll feel more comfortable taking that risk. Yes, and, and that, that's why I came back and said what happens next year when, when, when the supply and demand curve has gone, gone back to normal and, and the business model can only be sustained at, at selling at normal prices. Um, it's a charity called Concordia that's been overseeing this stuff. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I, I admire you, actually. I love the idea of you just thinking, do you know what? I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go and do that. They describe the response as phenomenal uh, to a call out for people in Britain to apply for this work. Uh, Monster, one of the job search sites, has seen users searching for farm or farm worker jobs nearly tripling. The problem is, of course, reality rather than um, interest or desire. And these are the numbers that I wanted to get right before I shared them with you. The chief executive of, of the charity, Concordia, uh, said that 36,000 people had registered interest. That might include Dave. 6,000 of them had then conducted a video interview. So if you're one of these people, what happens between 36,000 and 6,000? Is that when you get told what the work involves? Is that when they say, you've got to be there, you've got to be at your station at half past four in the morning, you're, you're, this is what the work involves. If you don't pick X number of cauliflowers, then you probably won't 
be asked back tomorrow because we're actually losing money on you. That's part of the problem with Dave's pay rise theory. Um, and then there was 36,000 green bottles standing on the wall and suddenly there's only 6,000 left. Now, take the 6,000 who conducted a video interview, put them through the funnel of what employers want, and 900 people were offered a job. So from 36,000 expressions of interest, 900 people were offered a job. Um, I've got another one up my sleeve, but I shall take a call first, and then I'll tell you. So we went from 36,000 to 6,000, from 6,000 to 900 job offers. After we've spoken to Colin, I'll tell you how many people took up a job offer and presumably had a crack at working in the fields. But first, Colin's in Alston Ferry. Colin, what would you like to say? James, I'd like to dispel some myths about the money side of things, of what these people earn. Uh, a good. Friend, good friend of mine lives down a lane next to one of these farms that actually they harvest the crops that you have to pick by hand. Now, these people who come from Slovakia, Romania, are earning between five and six hundred pounds a week. They, yes, that's they, what I thought. But, but they're on price. Are they doing work. it pro rata? Are they do, they're doing piecework? Uh, yes, basically. Right. And the thing is, yeah, so, it, so you're not going to make that. You're not going to. I just need to clarify this because not everyone's as, as clued up as you are. You're not going to make that sort of money until you've got quite good at it. Exactly. But yes. it's a question of the other. The other point I wanted to make is that there have been what I'll say. Uh, I'll, I'll use the term English people have gone to do it. Mm. And they've only earned eighty pounds a week because whenever yeah. the phone goes ding, they stop work. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit of a stereotype. It's a bit of a generalisation, Colin. But I tell, they're, 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 they're not. I mean, it, well, fair enough. Again, it's an anecdote rather than than evidence. But it's 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 coming from you. I've got no reason to doubt it. And and you're describing the difference between a 19 year old Brit who spends their life pinging away on social media and a 25 year old Romanian who's come for three months of the year to get their head down and trouser as much cash as they humanly can by picking cauliflowers like it's going out of fashion. Yeah, but and if you also look at, I mean, I've spoken to some of these people and, the, you know, yeah. if you go back to Romania, I mean, the overheads they have for their housing costs are minimal compared to yes, here. Yes, of course. Yes, and then you know, that's the economic calculation, isn't it? We'll do three months' work in Britain, and then we can come back here, and that money will go so much further than it would in Britain, which is why they, they're happy to live in a caravan, batten down the hatches, and do nothing but work until the until the clock dings, until the until until it's time up. Um, is there a solution to this? Can we keep can we keep picking the fruit and veg without having these workers? In the in the way that you describe. No, I, I don't. I don't think you'd ever meet the productivity. I don't think you would. But partly because of the temporary the nature point of, of the view, work. Yes. Yeah, from a personal point of view, I picked grapes in France many many years ago, and I slept right, on yeah. my own camp bed in a in a room yes. with just a sink in it. You know, so I, I have an yes. understanding of how they live. And that, but that was at a stage in your life when that was quite an attractive way to spend a summer. I think that's this is similar to the romantic memories of of hop picking holidays, which were lovely for people who couldn't have any other kind of holiday, but probably given the choice between a fortnight on the Costa del Sol or a fortnight picking hops on a farm in Kent, most people these days would choose the fortnight on the Costa del Sol. Exactly, you know, it, uh, <laughs> but but that's the reality of the situation. Is that. I, I, I mean, for many people in Britain, I have great sympathy because the overheads are killing people. I think the overheads of, of rent and housing. Housing, uh, housing, and housing, 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 all day long. And transport, and the absence of public transport. I mean, you couldn't have done that job in France on the vineyard if you were riding your bike to, to work every day because you needed to be sleeping on site to make the economics make sense. So those three things I've written down, temporary nature of the work, the living nature of the work and transport issues have got more to do with why British people can't do this work than, as Colin has just beautifully demonstrated, than the wages do. Although although Dave in Brighton was a stand-up guy and clearly sincere, he'd done his calculations. If it's piecework and you're really good at it, you can, as Colin tells us, make, make five or six hundred quid a week, which is, you know, close to or above national average income. Uh, 26 minutes to 12 is the time. Uh, continue our conversation, a really interesting conversation. I, I, I do occasionally say to the producer, um, uh, it'd be good to speak to some racists. 
but I'm not sure on the fruit picking question that it is necessarily um, necessary, actually. I, I think there are lots of reasons why British workers don't take work on fruit and vegetable farms that don't admit xenophobic answers. Um, unfortunately, of course, it was the xenophobes that won the argument, which is why they're now having to fly in Romanians to pick fruit and vegetable uh, crops on a... Uh, well, uh, uh, on a, an unprecedented scale, but with the caveat, of course, that COVID-19 has been a big contributory factor. Theo Oshwood, who I haven't spoken to for weeks, is at the other end of the line. He's he's back at LBC Towers in Leicester Square Well, I remain in my shed. Welcome back, Theo. It's, it's lovely to have you back on board. Thank you. Um, but we, we've, we've, we've allowed the B word out of quarantine briefly this morning in the conversation about fruit picking, but it occurred to me that this intervention or, or expression of opinion by the head of the IMF yesterday about the possibility of an extension was worth a quick explainer from you. I'll put in a, an early caveat, which is that the, um, uh, the woman who runs the IMF these days was very, very positive about the Treasury and the Bank of England's response financially to the crisis. Just, just to nip in the bud any ignorant screams of, of bias. She had very positive things to say about many elements of the British government's response to the COVID-19 crisis. But then she moved on to the question of this extension. Yes, she did. Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva of the runs the International Monetary uh, Fund has said that it would not be wise to add more uncertainty to the economic economic outlook uh, by deciding not to uh, trigger an extension to the transition period, which of course runs out on December the thirty first. Uh, of this year. And that warning, of course, comes as uh, David Frost, who's leading the negotiations for the UK, and Michel Barnier, uh, who's leading the negotiations for uh, the European Union, uh, said that there would be three further rounds of negotiations on those uh, trade talks between now and, and June. And you'll remember that back at the uh, back in February and at the end of February, Michael Gove, the minister in charge um, for leading those negotiations for the UK, ha has said that June the 30th would be a cut off um, for the UK, that if enough progress wasn't made in those uh, negotiations, then we would revert to uh, an Australian type relationship with the European Union. And of course, Australia doesn't have a trade deal uh, with the European Union and we'd lose that uh, six months of trade talks to prepare or would substitute it uh, to prepare for um, leaving uh, the European Union on World Trade Organization terms on December the 31st, the transition period. Uh, and that, um, from what Kristalina Christina Georgieva is saying, is would be unwise because it would just add to the uncertainty um, that, uh, that faces the economy as a result of uh, the lockdown measures that have been taken by governments across uh, Europe and here uh, in the UK. And of course, earlier in the week, uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility um, warned that in the next quarter, in this quarter, the UK economy could shrink by 35%, um, which would amount to the worst recession uh, in more than 100 years, although the OBR went on to say that the economy would bounce back fairly quickly. And, and as you did say, you did use the word could. It, 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 it's not a forecast. No, it's not. It's, 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 a, it's, yes, a, possible, it's, it's a possible scenario. So, I mean, I, I, the, the optics, some prominent Brexit supporters have sort of um, allowed themselves to finally acknowledge that it's going to be hard and it's going to hurt, otherwise they'd still be arguing that we should crack on with it. They're now saying, well, of course an extension would be a good idea, but the government is still the not budging on this. How, how much of that is, is policy and how much of it is optics? At the moment, um, it's all about the optics of Boris Johnson having delivered Brexit on January the 31st, got the UK out of the European Union. Uh, the government does not want to be seen to be suddenly reneging uh, on its promise to um, get uh, to end the transition period on December the 31st. And it's worth remembering, it would require a change in the law because back when, uh, after Boris Johnson and the Conservatives won the election, they tweaked uh, the Withdrawal Agreement Implementation Bill, the legislation that underpins our exit from the European Union uh, to make it binding, legally binding, <laughs> that we cannot extend the transition period. So if Boris Johnson uh, and the government, Dominic Raab, who is, of course, leading the government at the moment, uh, wanted to actually uh, decide, wanted to extend the transition period, 
they'd have to go back to the House of Commons and uh, put that in a form of legislation to repeal that particular section of the Withdrawal Agreement Implementation uh, Bill. Now, that was primarily designed as a way of stating, make it very clear to the country that the transition period and to Brexiters within the Conservative Party, that the country was going to end the transition period on December the 31st of this year. Um, mm. And of course, with a majority of 80 in the House of Commons, Boris Johnson and the government doesn't need to necessarily worry about um, uh, the the difficulty of overcoming uh, that particular he, hurdle he that it set it, itself. He, the, the ERG would, would change their tune completely from what they were insisting last year, you're, you're suggesting. Well, they, they, would need to, they, would need to, um, they would need to change their tune. Now, of course, what could be, could be different is that what the country faces going into uh, the summer and into the autumn is very different from what anybody could have imagined the country would face in terms of the economic well, outlook exactly. and the hardship because of what has happened as a result of uh, coronavirus. But as you reminded us at the outset, it was essentially the single platform upon which the entire general election was conducted in December. Yes. So, yes, it, w it was the single platform, but... People, but the, when the facts change, sir, I change my mind. What do you do? They could say, perhaps. <laughs> they could. The, the, the Boris Johnson and, and the Conservatives were very clear that to get Brexit done, we have to leave, we had to leave on January the 31st. But it is, of course, worth reminding everybody um, that um, we are still part of uh, European rules and regulations. And, of course, all the benefits that the European Union has to offer during this transition period, hence the row... Uh, a few weeks ago about the ventilators and whether and we could have accepted... procurement scheme. Exactly. And, and in conclusion, just to clarify Michael Gove's disingenuousness when he talked about Australia, Australia has lots and lots of trade deals with other territories it and other markets. It doesn't have a trade deal just, with the European Union. Just not with the European yeah. Union. So and they would quite like would one. Be, I know, but when he, he, he moots the possibility that we could be like Australia in the context of trade relations with the European Union, he... he conveniently ignores the fact that Australia has trade agreements with many, many markets and we, on current trajectories, would have precisely none. Or we would simply roll over those trade deals on terms that we agreed with the European, that we agreed when we were part of the European Union, so that we don't have we, the benefit, we, we, we don't have the, the benefit of having gone away and negotiated right. something better because we're not willing to... Um, no, we'll be lucky if we get to keep it the same way, given that these agreements were negotiated with a market of 500 million people, and we'll be saying, can we have the same terms and conditions for a market of 50 million people that can't even sell... Yeah, but we do, have, we, do have we do have continuity agreements that have been agreed. I think we're up to about 18 at the moment. Yes. At last count. There may have been some more in the meantime. So, not covering services, most no, of them? No, no. Okay, which is percentage of the British economy, about 10 still, is it? Or is it... Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. We shall see what happens in this field. It's great to have you back, Theo. Thank you very much. You Lovely on, to be back. On Twitter. No, it's really nice to hear your voice. My feeling is that they will... Um, uh, that they will have to extend it. And I'm not even going to express strong opinions on it because uh, I mean, my views on Brexit in general are pretty well documented. But the idea that you'd come out of the worst economic crisis in peacetime history um, and, and then embark upon a plan, a deliberate plan to impose economic sanctions upon your own population and turn up tear up decades of world-class trade agreements and treaties. I even, even with my um, deep knowledge of such matters. I, I can't believe that they'd be that destructive. Even now, I just can't believe it. Not for a minute. Uh, 11.43 is the time. Let's get back to fruit picking with, a, with another reminder of how much love is coming in for Theo Usherwood via the texts, which I can't see at the moment, and via Twitter, which I can. Paul is in Brittany. Paul, what can you tell us about fruit picking? Well, well James, great to talk to you. Um, I was Likewise. I'm, a, I'm an ex-London famous taxi driver who voted to remain firstly and um, in 19... <laughs> I don't need to know that I don't need to know that no, well, I, I just wanted to put it in <laughs> I'm, uh, in, in 1971 I uh, went down with an agency Concordia down to the southwest of France oh, and um, I, I was um, I was uh, down there for the whole season picking grapes and um, picking apples and um, vegetables and I can tell you now it's very, very hard work. I mean, to give you an example, um, you two people would do a whole line of grapes, you know, a uh, whole, whole row of grapes, and that would take all morning. And you, you used to use um, you used um, uh, clippers, and it, on many occasions you used to 
clip the ends of your thumbs and fingers. And so it was very oh, painful. And, of course, you're on oh. your back. You're on your back all day. And uh, it, I, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. And in those days, of course, we were paid about 10 euros a day, I think, which was about How much? about a pound, 10 euros. And, and um, what were you doing it for? Were you doing it for the sun and the, and the, and the, and the, and the French, the Gallic air? Or were you saving up to then go off on a little tour of France? Or, or no, just out of no, interest, to be I, honest I was, with you? I, actually, James, at the time, I was actually homeless. And uh, it just seemed right. a good idea to go down there. And um, I, I can tell you now, yeah. what, what really impressed me was that they, they actually did feed me. Uh, I, I slept in my yes. own tent, but the, the farmer did feed me. And they were the first ones to introduce me to that um, tradition of putting red wine into soup. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> ever had red wine in soup, but I can I can recommend in onion it. soup. I have. I've, I've put. I've, 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 oh, I've maybe it was. In onion but soup. Very, they're, they're I haven't very put it in tomato soup. Very generous <laughs> and absolutely love it. I love it. Um, and did um, you fall in? Is that why you're ringing me from Brittany now? Because you fell in love with France yeah. in 1971, or, or absolutely, is it? absolutely, absolutely. In fact, oh, I, I've lovely. been coming backwards and forwards, coming backwards and forwards for 30 years now. And uh, when I got here. Um, uh, I bought this little cottage with um, no running water or electric, and uh, slowly oh, did it up. And put apart a jeet. from that, a jeet. Well, yeah, a jeet. well I, I do have a couple of jeets, but that's something else. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful. And it's um, it's I, I, because of my job, I was able to come backwards and forwards, and it's been absolutely. Absolutely wonderful, and um, believe it or uh, not, that's I came funny. Down of course, because people drive ta people drive taxis in London in the same way that these Romanians pick fruit. In that they not everyone puts in an eleven month year, do they? Some of your comrades no. in arms break no. break the year up a bit. I mean, or at least they did. Oh, absolutely. Pu. Oh, yeah. we had, they did pre we had a guy called my, we had a guy called Miami John. So there's no. Uh, so you know where he lives. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly Spanish what I'm Ray. talking about. And Spanish Ray. Spanish Ray, Miami John. God, we be here all day. It's like an yeah, episode yeah. of Minder. Spanish, <laughs> Spanish Ray actually actually died, and um, three months later oh. he turned up again. <laughs> so he ended up this, um, um, dead Ray. <laughs> Lazarus. Uh, <laughs> we'll get, I can't wait for your memoirs, Paul. Um, enjoy Brittany, and thank you for that heads up. The work is backbreaking, actually. That, for me, is not a reason why British workers wouldn't do it necessarily, but it is, I suspect, a reason why that number that I promised to share with you uh, a moment ago is so astonishingly small. As, as you'll as you remember, I told you it went from, um, let's get it absolutely right, 36,000 online inquiries filtered down to 6,000 people when they found out a bit more about it who conducted a video interview. From 6,000 in the last 10 days, 900 people were actually offered jobs, and that will be partly because it's such backbreaking work. Employers will have to take a view on whether or not we could do it. And of the 900 people offered jobs over the last 10 days, from an initial inquiry of 36,000, 112 people have agreed contracts to accept employment. From 36,000 down to 112, as reality begins to bite. And, of course, there's no guarantee that all 112 people offered contracts will either, A, uh, well, they'll take up the contracts, they've agreed contracts, so no guarantee they'll turn up on day one, or, perhaps more importantly, day six. It's 11.48. Back to the question in hand. Why won't British people take up these jobs desperately needed work on British fruit and vegetable farms. Charlie is in Romford. Charlie, what do you reckon? Hi, James. Um, I can't understand how they're allowed to bring people in to do the work in the first place. Because if they come in and they've got COVID-19 virus, then they're going to end up in our hospitals in the country, which we've been told to stay at home and not to go to. Well, we've been told that we have to work from home if we possibly can but I, I don't know that anyone can pick fruit and vegetable from home charlie no but but people have been told, so it, so it know, gets filed under essential work and because they cannot find anybody to do it they they have to bring in people from from overseas i share some of your concerns about all flights coming into the country without passengers being properly checked but let me steer you back to to the question which is why on earth can't they find British people to do this work? Well, I, I think that you're probably right with the fact that they have to go and live on 
the farm because of starting at that time in the morning. It's going to be impractical to travel there. Mm. Um, but the, 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 the chap that phoned up earlier that said that he actually wanted to go and do it, but he worked out that he couldn't do it for less than £14 an hour. Yeah. Surely if the, if the farmers, it's going to be a case that they can't get workers unless they pay more or let the food rot in the ground, wouldn't it be better for them to pay more and let people like the guy... You know, I think well, like, again, as, as you heard the fellow who'd done it, would go and do it. it, yeah, 25, 26 grand a year, if you're good at it. Of course, if, if you're doing piecework, you're not going to be good at it on day one, but, but you might pick it up. I guess part of the problem with that is that um, the farmer might not make a profit. Okay, can't possibly pay 14 quid an hour to everybody picking fruit if he's currently paying them shy of nine. That, that'll, that'll put the business under. You can't, you can't be paying out more than you're bringing in. It's a yeah, tough one, isn't it? I, don't, it, it, I, I, I it wonder how you feel. Um, yes, go on. I was only, I'm, I'm only sort of thinking to myself, that if it's a case that you can't get people from outside to do it because you're not, you know, it's not practical to fly people in because of the, um, the, the load that that's going to put on our National Health Service if they come over here and get sick. I, I, I don't side. think you need to worry about that quite as much as, as you would need to worry about, um, you know, the fruit and veg shortages up and down the country. Uh, and these will be young, very, very fit people, so they're a lot more likely to cope with COVID-19, whether they caught it here or had it when they arrived, than, than a lot of the rest of us are. I mean, we're talking about already a quarter of crops rotting in the fields, going unpicked, and, and th these attempts are there to desperately try to get the remaining three quarters um, off the trees, off the bushes, off the plants, and into our supermarkets. Now, it's a mystery, Charlie. None of us have got, have got the answer, but of course, um, they probably should have explained this to us when they encouraged many, many people to vote to abolish freedom of movement. Mark's in Didsbury. Mark, what do you reckon? How you doing, James? Oh, good, Mark. What's on your mind? Um, so, I think the whole fruit picking thing is like a microcosm of what the whole um, pandemic has exposed in our country, and it's the race to the bottom, and that's the race to the bottom and how we pay people and what we pay for things. Um, you know, if there was a universal basic income, people would be much more likely to take up seasonal work. That, that's that's just stands to reason. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue with you on that. I, I mean, it, it, it stands to reason that if you were getting a basic income without working, then you wouldn't need as much from working to um, make it worth your while. Yeah, and and and, and that, that you know the chap you had on earlier arguing about it's going to lead to loads of deaths if we don't open up the economy. I think that mm. the big elephant in the room is that what nobody's talking about is the only way out of this economic situation is taxation. And that's the only way that we're going to get back to any level of normality. And that's what needs to happen. He I, think he, I think he hinted at it, didn't he, Sunak? I mean, some people chose to believe that he was actually suggesting a return to austerity. But I, I think one doesn't know where the power lies, really, in, in Downing Street. And, of course, it's a government essentially elected on three and a half year old lies but Rishi Sunak's a relatively clean skin I, I get the impression he knows he's going to have to put taxes up he knows that's the mm. only way the deficit's going to be inconceivable when this is over it, it is and, and I don't know why we aren't already talking about some sort of government bonds that that that, that very top percentage of the society are forced to buy because we're supposed to be talking wrong. about cauliflower we're supposed to be talking about cauliflowers i let you i gave you your head on on universal basic income but now you're talking about government bonds why won't british workers do the work given that and your some of your financial arguments are strong but the um the piecework element of it and if you're good at it you become you could be getting five or six hundred quid a week. Now, that's an attractive salary for a lot of people, so why won't British people do it? Because if it's only for three months of the year and then it takes them eight weeks to get signed back on to get the benefits they were on before, it's just not worth the risk. Because five or six... And that's then we're back to the temporary nature of it. So I think we got it right at the outset. It's temporary, it, it has to be live-in, and there's no earthly way that you could do it using public transport. So why won't British people do it answer because they can't it's not got that much even to do with the work ethic it's all about logistics nothing to do with work ethic that's nonsense um I, I just don't believe that i mean what happened before we had freedom of movement who picked the fruit and veg then it was british people that done it 
It was, although, I mean, in circumstances that are very, very different from the ones that we enjoy now. I, I think the work ethic probably is relevant to the people who keep saying that it's easy. The reason why they won't go and do it um, is, is because it's back-breaking, incredibly hard work. They, they, whenever people say oh, we should be doing it ourselves, they're usually saying, yeah, not me, though. That sort of, you know, fictional unemployed person over there, or, or that, that usually, I suppose we'd scapegoat immigrants in this context, but they can't use immigrants here as cannon fodder because they've just... Um, voted to abolish freedom of movement. I, I think the universal basic income argument is gaining traction during the COVID-19 crisis. I really do. Thank you, Mark. Um, 11.58 is the time. Have I got time to squeeze in one more before Mystery Hour, or should we just talk up? Should we just, just should I squeeze in Roy in St. Albans? Roy, why, why do you think they can't find any British fruit pickers? Well, first of all, through gritted teeth, I find myself agreeing with you. Having, having been hot picking and potato picking in the 40s, it is hard work, and life has got too easy now. Uh, the British working people have, have got such a good life now. I've watched a lot of my grandsons. However, two things are going to happen. Either because of the current situation, we're going to have a surplus of labour when this finishes, or when I look at videos and I see in China and other places, in Vietnam and other places, um, machinery is picking and planting rice. Why don't the farmers invert, you know, in, invest in technology? And which will happen. So you're worried about... You're worried about a surfeit of labour. You're worried about there being too many workers, and you also want to, me to mechanise farming. No, what I'm saying, we can have two scenarios. Either when the current situation has ended, and people working at home and things like that, we can have a surplus of labour. And, and as you know, um, and, 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 and you would add to supply, that. Isn't it? You, you would add to that by mechanising farming, of course. Well, it, it will happen. You know, you can't stop technology. You can't just, stop just, to, just to clarify, you're, wor you're worried about an oversupply of labour, and you're also wondering why the farms can't bring in machines to do all the picking. No, I'm not worried about it. I'm, I'm saying it's a oh. that will happen. At my great age, it's not going to affect me very much. No, well, you keep those teeth gritted, Roy. You keep those teeth gritted and, and those um, little grey cells doing whatever it is they're doing.